In July 2020, the CPSC published their final rule for gates and enclosures. While incorporating by reference the ASTM safety standard, ASTM F1004-19, the Commission has voted to include additional requirements in the federal rule. These requirements comprise a separate warning label on the top rail of pressure mounted gates that require wall cups and visual side pressure indicators for all other pressure mounted gates. Given these substantial changes, CPSC commissioners voted to extend the 12 month time period between the publication and effective dates for manufacturers to adjust their products to meet the federal rule. The effective date for the new federal rule is July 6, 2021, but your company should plan accordingly and redesign your products in a timely manner. Um, so our agenda today, oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so I um, uh, have been with the CPSC for about four years. I'm working in the Department of Epidemiology. Um, and if you don't know me, you may know my colleagues, Shelby Mathis and Will Cusey. Uh, we also have an intern, Grace Elman, who's been working with us um, during her breaks from school over the past few years. So we're a small team of three and sometimes four, uh, but we do answer about 2,300 inquiries from small businesses throughout the year. So we're very happy to make this presentation on gates and enclosures to help businesses understand this new requirement from the CPSC. Um, so during the presentation today, we'll define exactly what a gate and enclosure is, what the labeling and instructional literature requirements are, testing requirements. Um, if you've been manufacturing children's products in the past, you should be familiar with the CPC requirement. We'll uh, show you a few recall examples and then share the CPSC business resources that we have. And then finally, um, we'll follow it up with a Q&A session if you have additional questions. So some history on the gates and enclosures rulemaking. On July 7th of 2019, uh, the NPR notice of proposed rulemaking was issued. And then about a year later, this past July, the final rule was published. So if you're aware of the existing voluntary standard for gates and enclosures, it is ASTM F1004-19. Um, so if you're already following that standard, that's fantastic. Um, just keep in mind that this new mandatory standard uh, that was published in uh, July 2020 incorporates the voluntary standard with two specific modifications that you would be required to comply with uh, next year when the um, standard becomes effective. So those requirements are that gates with wall cups must include a separate conspicuous warning label on the top rail of the gate regarding correct installation using the wall cups in order to meet the 30 pound push out force test. And also gates without wall cups must use visual side pressure indicators to signal to consumers whether the gate is correctly installed in order to meet the 30 pound push out force test. Um, so again, that voluntary standard, um, it's a good idea to be compliant with that now leading up until um, the effective date of this. Um, just remember those two changes that the mandatory standard makes. So the purpose of the ASTM voluntary standard, um, two major uh, tenants here, it addresses the incidence of head and neck entrapment in children's expansion gates and expandable enclosures and addresses the ability of a pressure gate to resist push out force. Um, so it does not address incidents in which gates or enclosures are blatantly misused. So in 16 CFR part 1239, uh, we define both what a gate and an enclosure is. Um, there are similar product types, but they do have some differences. So a gate is a barrier intended to be erected in an opening such as a doorway to prevent the passage of young children, but which can be removed by older persons who are able to operate the locking mechanism. Um, so a gate can be between a doorway, it can be at the top of the stairs. An enclosure um, defined by the same standard is a self-supporting barrier intended to completely surround an area or play space within which a young child may be confined. Um, so the gate is erected in an opening and enclosure is entirely self-supporting, um, uh, entirely surrounding the child. And these products are intended for children um, ages six months to 24 months. 
So defining gates and enclosures, um, we, uh, in the voluntary standard, they talk about expansion and expandable. Um, these are the, the terms used in the ASTM standard. Um, CPSC reviewed hazard patterns and indicated that uh, whether the gate was expandable or an expansion gate um, or not, it had the same hazard patterns. So we decided to remove those terms from the mandatory standards. So we just refer to these category of products as gates and enclosures, not specifically expansion gates and expandable enclosures, although they are included within that definition. So here are some examples of gates. Um, as you can see, they are erecting a barrier between two walls at the top of the stairs, um, could be uh, for a doorway. Um, so these specific gates, again, are not meant as an endorsement of the product shown. We're just showing some examples of what those, those gates could look like. And then here are some examples of enclosures. So again, these um, are not affixed to a wall. They are fully self-supporting and they completely enclose the child within a play area. All right, so we're going to move on to our first um, poll question. So the question is, is this product an enclosure? So the product you see on your screen, it has a, um, a uh, hexagonal shape if you could advance to the next slide, Rita. Um, so once again, if you'd like to join us, you can go to slido.com or you can uh, scan that QR code to enter uh, your, your choices here. So I'm just about to start the poll. So do you think this product is an enclosure? Give everyone a few minutes to make their choices. Okay, so we see a um, majority of respondents are saying that no, this product is not an enclosure. Um, a few are on the fence with yes. All right, next, uh, next slide. So this is a bit of a tricky question because this actually doesn't fall in the scope of what we're discussing today, but this product is actually what we consider a play yard. Uh, and the difference between an enclosure and a play yard is that a play yard has an attached floor um, whereas enclosures do not. So those enclosures are fully um, self-supporting with no attached floor. If your product looks like the product on the right, uh, it would be required to comply with 16 CFR part 1221, the safety standard for play yards. Um, otherwise, it may be in this other category we're discussing today, which is 16 CFR part 1239. And next slide. All right, so here we have a picture of a product that is, um, you can see there's a child pushing a pet uh, in front of a gate. Um, so the question we have for you is, is, would this product be considered a child gate or a pet gate? Okay, so I think we have most respondents here saying that this product would be considered a child gate. Um, so let's see what the answer would be. Um, so this gate would actually be a child gate. So even though it's shown um, protecting a barrier from both pets and children, um, the very uh, idea that it could be used with children means that it needs to meet the child product standards, including the gates and enclosures standard. So if your gate is entirely intended for and marketed to um, uh, pet owners and there's no indication that it's a child gate, 
um, it would be outside the scope of this standard. But um, marketing makes it a huge difference on how CPSC would view your product and how a consumer would view your product. So we strongly recommend visiting cpsc.gov slash children's product for more information on how to define your product if you're not sure um, how, how it should be classified. So labeling and instructional literature, um, this must be permanently on the product and its packaging per the, the voluntary standard requirements. Um, so first thing is going to be your manufacturer, distributor, or seller name. Uh, second is your place of business. That includes your city, state, and mailing address, including zip code, and your telephone number. And this requirement comes from 16 CFR 1130.4. Um, so this is very specific to durable infant and toddler products. Um, so if, you, if you're familiar with general um, children's products, you may know about tracking label information. Um, that is not as uh, strict as the durable infant and toddler labeling requirements. So be sure that your, entire, your entirety of your contact information is included on that packaging. Um, you also must include a code or a mark identifying the date, um, including the minimum of month and year of manufacture of the product, and then any additional batch or run number uh, that could help identify when that product was created. So if you um, have an issue with one particular production run of your product, having a batch or run number, serial number, some way to identify that makes it a lot easier to identify those specific um, instances uh, of an issue with the product rather than your entire product line. And if you have um, a copy of this presentation, you can click on that link to our page on uh, just the basic children's product tracking label information as well. Next slide. So informational statements included with the product need to include the assembly, installation, operation, folding, maintenance, and cleaning instructions as applicable. Um, as well as any warning statements. Um, also very important to include the size openings on which the product is meant to be used and instructions to discontinue use of the product if it becomes damaged, broken, or disassembled. So gates must have a statement of the limitations regarding the use of any included mounted hardware and inform information regarding where to install the gate relative to the floor. Uh, and then if your gate is going to be used at the top of the stairs, you also would need to include a statement saying the minimum distance to the first step of those stairs. So here's an example of a few of the warning labels um, that you, you may require on your product. Um, so the children, you know, the giant um, hazard symbol that children have died or been seriously injured when gates are not securely installed, um, that include, includes a, a variety of warning messages there. The second one is a specific warning regarding the wall cups, um, that they must be installed to keep the gate in place. Uh, that uh, Without the wall cups, a child can push out and escape. Um, and these warnings must be permanent, conspicuous, and in sans serif font. Um, there's some testing requirements to make sure that uh, those labels are permanent as well. So on your retail packaging, this should state the recommended age of the user of the product. Um, that the product is not to be used with a child that is able to climb over or dislodge or open the gate and the applicable opening sizes for the product. So the idea here is that when the consumer is going to the retail establishment that they're able to determine whether or not this product is appropriate for their child and whether or not it is appropriate for the space in which they're trying to install it. In addition, retail packaging for products with wall cups should include, uh, you must install wall cups to keep the gate in place. Without wall cups, children can push out and escape. So we saw an example of that label in the previous slide. Um, and then if the wall cups or mounting hardware are packed in a hardware bag, that bag shall be marked or labeled with that warning statement as well so that the, the consumer is well aware of that requirement. So as I mentioned, um, these class of products are under the durable infant and toddler products uh, category. 
which means that they also require a product registration card, which needs to be attached directly to the product. And you can find out about this requirement in 16 CFR part 1130. So this means that you must provide consumers with a postage paid product registration card and maintain records of their names, addresses, emails, and other contact information, um, you know, in the event of a recall that you could contact these consumers. And um, that you must permanently place manufacturer name and contact info, model and name, and number and the date of manufacture on each uh, one of these durable products. So we do have a page that goes into these requirements more detail has some examples um, that you can uh, click this link to visit. And so our next poll question, do I need to provide a paper product registration card if I sell direct to consumer and maintain contact information for all of my customers? So I just open that poll. Okay, it looks like most of the respondents have said uh, yes, that you would need to provide a paper product registration card, uh, even if you're selling direct to consumer. So I'll move on to the next slide. Um, the answer is yes. There's actually no exception to the paper registration card requirements in 16 CFR 1130. Um, we do quite get this question quite frequently with the durable infant and toddler products because um, retailers feel like they've maintained uh, great control over which customers they have, but again, there's no exception to this. You're always going to need to provide that paper registration card um, uh, directly on the product itself. So as far as chemical testing requirements, these are things that apply to all children's products. Um, the two major requirements are lead content testing under 15 USC 1278 alpha and then lead in paint and surface coatings testing under 16 CFR part 1303. Um, so two different limits here. So the total lead content testing, you can have no more than 100 parts per million in accessible parts of children's products. There are some exemptions to the testing requirements here. Um, so if your product is made of wood, paper, or similar materials, um, if it is what we call CMYK process printing inks, which are inks that um, fully embed within the material that they're printed on. Um, and then also natural fibers and manufactured fibers um, would be exempt under 16 CFR 1500.91. Um, so those, those are materials that would not require testing. Um, for the lead and paint and surface coatings, that limit is 90 parts per million. Um, and, it, and so this requirement is only applicable if there is a paint or surface coating. So if you have um, a solid wood gate um, and that is uncoated, unpainted, um, that may not necessarily require that lead and paint testing, um, but any sort of paint coated pieces, coated metal that would require testing under that lead and paint standard. So next polling question, does the mounting hardware included with my product need to meet total lead content requirements? So that is the uh, 15 USC 1278A, the 100 parts per million for total lead content. Give me a moment, I will get this poll added here.
okay, so most people have said yes, that this mounting hardware included with the product would need to meet the total lead content requirements. Um, and that is true. So any accessible components of children's products must meet the 100 parts per million limit on total lead content. Um, so again, there's some materials that would be exempt, but any part of that hardware that is potentially accessible for a child to touch or mouth um, would require testing for total lead content. So next, our basic physical mechanical testing requirements for children's products include small parts and sharp points and edges. Um, so the small part requirement is in 16 CFR part 1500-01. Um, and this refers to small parts that would fit entirely into a small part cylinder, which is specified in the regulation. Um, so you may have seen these. They're made to approximate the airway of a child. Um, it's about the same size as a roll of um, a toilet paper tube. Um, and any product that's intended for use by children under age three cannot have small parts with limited ex exceptions, but gates and enclosures are not one of those exceptions, exceptions, so they would need to be tested as well. So any components that would detach from the product after use and abuse testing can be considered small parts. Um, and then for sharp points and edges, this is in 16 CFR 1500.48 to 49. Um, and there's certain uh, test methods to determine whether or not a sharp point or edge is present in the product. Okay, so our next poll question, does the mounting hardware included separately with my product need to meet these small parts requirements? And here's an example of what that um, uh, mounting hardware might look like. Okay, so we're about evenly split on this one between yes and no about the small parts requirements for the hardware. Um, so next slide. Um, so it's a bit of a tricky question, um, but uh, actually no. So the testing shall be completed on the products installed according to manufacturer's instructions. So if that manufacturer's instructions says that all of those small parts um, or all of those mounting hardware parts are supposed to be affixed to the product and to the wall, um, that's where the product will be tested and how the product will be viewed. So, um, however, just keep in mind that installation hardware cannot become liberated during testing to create, um, to create that small part. So specifically for the gates and enclosures requirements, here are a list of some of the physical and mechanical testing uh, that you will need to, to comply with. Um, the latching, locking, and hinge mechanism durability test, automatic closing system test, locking mechanism test, release mechanism test, a tension test and torque test, vertical strength test, a horizontal push out test, completely bound openings and bottom spacing, partially bound openings at the uppermost edge, and then slat strength test. So details about what um, all of this testing entails are included in the ASTM standards. So um, any manufacturers of these products, I strongly encourage you to um, you know, read through this, this standard and make sure that you understand uh, the, these variety of tests. So we have pictures of some of these tests, some not all of them, just to give you an idea of the type of mechanical testing that would uh, be undergone at a third party lab. Um, so here we have the visual side pressure indicator example. Um, so that side, if, if your gate is a pressure mounted gate, it must have that um, side pressure indicator. So as you can see here on the left, this is demonstrating insufficient pressure. You see that red indicator showing between um, those two pieces of the product. And then on the right hand side, we have sufficient pre pressure where the indicator is no longer showing because there is sufficient pressure in the gate. Um, next is this vertical strength test example. So 
Uh, the idea is that you don't want a child to be able to compress the top of the gate uh, and then um, you know, uh, make its way over uh, that gate. So the uppermost top rails, edges, or framing components uh, shall not fracture, disengage, fold, or have a deflection that reduces it to less than 22 inches from the floor uh, when you're testing it in accordance with those test methods. So if this top, if this top pay, um, in that picture, if the top, um, the lowest point of that gate is less than 22 inches, that would be a failure of this test. So here's an example of a partially bound opening. Um, so you can see at the top that there are um, several sides that could potentially entrap a child, but there is an actual opening at the top. So we call it partially bound because it's bound on several sides, but not all sides. Um, so here's just an example of a couple of the test probes that would be used to determine if um, this product is compliant with that partially bound opening requirement. And then here we have the completely bounded openings and bottom spacing. So um, at the bottom of the gate, uh, the, the, the enclosure is completely bound by both the floor and the product itself. Um, so they will do testing to make sure that um, certain probes cannot fit through the bound of that bottom spacing. Here's an example of the horizontal push out test. And this is to ensure that a gate would not uh, dislodge or open with a sufficient amount of pressure um, as described in the, the test methods. And some other performance requirements that are in the standard, um, structural integrity, so just no sharp edges, exposed coils, uh, any breakage of attachment systems, um, no opportunity for scissoring, shearing, or pinching. Um, there's also a requirement in a test for permanency of the labels and warnings and an adhesion test for warning labels that are applied directly to the surface of the product. So you want to make sure that those labels are fixed strongly enough that a consumer is not going to be able to easily uh, peel off that, that warning label and lose that information. Um, and then finally, for holes or slats, there's certain requirements here that test fixtures should not uh, fit through them, um, and that's intended to, to make sure that small body parts like fingers and toes do not get uh, uh, stuck in those products. So there's different requirements for toys for gates and enclosures. Um, for gates, there shall be no toys or accessories attached to or sold with a gate. Um, the intent of a gate is to prevent a child from accessing an area, so you don't want to attach something to it that's gonna make that gate more attractive to the child. Um, with enclosures, toys are allowed. However, um, they must meet all of the requirements of the US Toy Safety Standard, which incorporates ASTM F963-17. So if you have questions about the toy standard, we have a variety of resources on our website. Um, on the toy safety standard, we have a few webinars that discuss that uh, standard as well. All right, so our next question, can I rely on product safety testing my product on my gate and enclosure in-house? So if I'm doing that testing um, in my own facility, can I rely on that testing? Looks like we got um, some votes in, but I may, our connection to Slido may have just been, been broken. So again, it looks like we're about split 50-50 between yes and no for, um, oh no, we're still on the last um, slide, aren't we? Rita, could we try to, um, to get out of the full screen mode for this slide and reload this particular Slido poll. I think it's still showing the old poll that was um, that was in there. It is for some reason, Elizabeth, but I can tell you that it looks like 78% of our participants have said no. 
and 22% have said yes. Okay, great. We'll move on to the next slide. So um, the answer is actually no. So uh, we do uh, uh, very much encourage in-house testing for durable infant and toddler products so that you're not going out to a lab with a product that is definitely going to fail um, and so that you can have confidence in your product. But durable infant, in, uh, durable infant or toddler products must be tested at a CPSC laboratory. Um, so even if you're a small batch manufacturer, so that is without exception. So in order to find one of those testing labs, uh, you can visit our website, www.cpsc.gov forward slash lab search. Um, here you can narrow your search by region um, and by scope. So when you are looking for a laboratory, you'll select 16 CFR part 1239, uh, the safety standard for gates and enclosures. And you should see a, lab, a list of all the laboratories that are accepted to test this standard. Um, so as you are aware, there's still about nine months before this standard becomes mandatory. Uh, at this time, there are no laboratories that have applied to be accepted to test to this standard. So um, if you have a laboratory that you have a good relationship with, you'd like to have your product tested through there, I recommend getting in touch with them, making them aware of this updated standard um, and that they should apply to be accepted to, to test for this, um, because at this time we don't have any labs that have, uh, that have applied for that um, acceptance. So if we do have any testing laboratories on the line, uh, you can submit your application to, to test the standard uh, via our website. Um, the link is right here. And so we accept labs on a test by test basis uh, and they must reapply with CPSC um, when their accreditation is renewed or at least every two years. Um, so that's in our uh, Code of Federal Regulations as well. We um, often get questions about the frequency of testing. Um, and of course, any time that there is a material change you always must retest your product. So if you've changed the product design, uh, your manufacturing process, if you're sourcing your component parts um, from a different um, supplier, um, all of those things would require complete uh, retesting of the product. Um, additionally, if there's any change that you know or think could affect the product's ability to comply with uh, these rules, uh, you would also need to retest. Um, and uh, again, uh, if you're manufacturing or if you're importing this product, you must um, make these uh, re retest your product after there's been a material change. So the periodic testing rule, um, they basically states that you must test your product on one, two or three year intervals, depending on the type of testing plan that you have. Um, so the vast majority of our manufacturers and importers just do this every year. Um, they just go out and get their product retested every year. Um, if you do have a production testing plan, you may be able to reduce that to every three years. Um, and if you are using a testing laboratory, laboratory accredited to this standard, uh, you could go to every three years. Um, but again, most um, manufacturers will just select to do the once per year. So if you want to be on that two-year interval, the production testing plan is discussed in 16 CFR 1107.21. Um, this is only possible, again, if there are no material changes to your product. Um, and as part of this, you must put in writing uh, the process management techniques that have been used, the tests that are being conducted, the intervals and measurements to be taken, um, the number of samples, an explanation describing how these techniques provide a higher degree of assurance of compliance. Um, and then there's additional requirements as well. So you can read about those in the standard. You can also read about those on our FAQ page. Um, but again, if you do wanna to move to that two year testing plan, um, you need to have a detailed uh, production testing plan in writing.
So if you've been manufacturing children's products, you should be uh, familiar with this children's product certificate or CPC requirement. So all children's products, including gates and enclosures, will require a CPC. Um, and this is where you will uh, certify in writing that your product is compliant with the applicable safety rules. So you can visit our website here, um, cpsc.gov forward slash CPC. Uh, there we have the seven questions that you would need to answer in your CPC, as well as a sample for a children's toy and for children's clothing. Um, we've also created a, a webinar on certificates of conformity, which includes the general cer uh, uh, certificate of conformity for general use products and CPCs as well. If you just want a quick summary of what is required in the CPC, it is basically these seven things. Um, so first will be a description of the products covered by the certificate. So this includes the product descriptions, model numbers, SKU numbers. Um, second is the citation to each CPSC safety rule which you are certifying your product. So if your product is a gate or enclosure, uh, you will need to list at least these four things here. The total lead content requirement, lead and paint and surface coatings, the small parts regulation, and then of course the new standard um, for gates and enclosures. The third thing is going to be your importer or domestic manufacturer contact information. Um, and the fourth is the contact information for the person maintaining the test records. So the, the CPC is a summary of information about your product. So you're, you will get your testing certificate from the CPSC accepted third party lab, and you will summarize some of that information in the CPC here. Um, and so that includes your date and place of manufacture, the location of testing and the date of test on which the certification is based, and then the contact information of the CPSC accepted testing laboratory will go in the last section. Your CPCs must accompany each product or shipment of products covered by this certificate. Uh, and you also must provide them to distributors and retailers. We don't require that they're provided to the ultimate end consumer, um, but you just need to be aware that uh, they need to be made available to CPSC and to Customs and Border Protection um, upon request. So we have um, confirmed that certificates in electronic form are uh, acceptable and they uh, must be created no later than um, the time of shipment or first distribution within the United States. So they don't necessarily need to be printed certificates, but they must be um, readily available and uh, accompany your products from overseas. Okay, and I think this might be our last poll question. See if we can get it to come up. Okay, so I've added it to, um, I've opened the poll on Slido. So if you are on Slido, you should be able to view it. And the question is, I received a report from a consumer of my product causing an injury to an adult. What should I do? Um, and my answers are, do nothing. If my product is compliant with all testing, labeling, and certification requirements, I do not need to keep record of consumer injuries. Um, the second option is keep an internal record of this complaint, but do not report it outside of the company. And the third is submit a report to CPSC through saferproducts.gov. So Elizabeth, right now it looks like we are split about 50-50 between 50% 50 of our respondents have said, keep an internal record of this complaint, but do not report outside of the company. 50% of our participants have said, submit a report to CPSC through saferproducts.gov. 
and no one has responded with do nothing. Okay, great. Um, we can move on to the next slide. Um, and you can click through to the end here. Uh, this is animated. So I'm very happy that nobody said do nothing. That should never be the, the um, answer to hearing that your product has injured um, one of your consumers. Um, so the actual correct answer is to submit a report to CPSC through saferproducts.gov. So this is our portal where consumers can um, report injuries uh, that were caused by products, but then also um, this connects to the business portal where businesses should uh, file Section 15 reports um, when they're made aware of injuries that were caused by products. So submitting a report to saferproducts.gov does not necessarily mean that any sort of action is going to be taken by um, CPSC or required by your company. It's just a notification of um, an injury that you were made aware of. Um, and you'll notice on this, um, this product, even though it's a children's product, caused an injury to an adult. Um, so whether injured a child or injured an adult, that's still something that CPSC would like to know about. Um, so you should still uh, report that through our safer products stock up portal. Okay, and now we have some examples of recalls here. Um, so this is a pressure mounted gate that posed a full a, um, fall hazard because of insufficient, insufficient pressure to hold the gate in the intended position. Um, and also uh, you'll see in the recall there, the lower metal bar could be considered a tripping hazard. Um, so this is an example of a, a gate that was previously recalled um, before there was the mandatory standard. And here's another example of an entrapment and strangulation hazard to the um, child because of the V-shaped opening along that top edge. So that partially bound opening um, uh, had potential to cause an injury. Um, so here's another example of uh, a recall that was, was completed um, prior to this standard. So I always recommend if you are producing a new product to search our um, recalls page. You can visit that by going to www.cpsc.gov forward slash recalls. Uh, and you can see issues that people have had in the past with, um, with recalls of products. Um, also, if you do go to saferproducts.gov, we've just updated this website um, less than a month ago, uh, uh, completely revamped the, the saferproducts.gov um, uh, outward facing portal. So um, you can actually search for consumer complaints there and see some issues that um, consumers have had with products just to give you an idea of, of some of the hazards that may be there. So here we have a list of our business resources. Um, again, you can visit our lab search page uh, to find laboratories uh, when when we do have laboratories that are accepted to test this standard that can test for you. Um, we also have a desktop reference guide which summarizes some of the, the helpful um, references we have for you, um, saferproducts.gov. And if you haven't used it yet, our regulatory robot tool, I think is a very neat, um, neat product on our page, which uh, asks you a few questions about your product and then it will summarize the mandatory file requirements in place uh, that you would need to comply with and has hyperlinks to all of our resources on the web as well. So here is my email address. Um, uh, if you would like to reach our entire team, you can email sbo at cpsc.gov. Um, and we are currently not manning the phones in the office, um, but you can uh, reach us and leave a voicemail. We will get back to you at 301-504-7945.